Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. It is titled Equity and Engagement, an Approach to Improving Staff Vaccination Rates. I'm Mark Raven from Value Capture. I'm going to be the host and moderator today uh, for this session that's going to provide a, a lot of really practical lessons learned, not just for the ongoing vaccination um, challenge, but I think there are leadership and organizational culture lessons that, that we can take uh, beyond this. So I know we're, uh, we're going to learn a lot today. We are joined by uh, a, a, a team of presenters and panelists, um, all with Legacy Health, and I'll introduce them uh, briefly real quickly. So um, first we have uh, Dom Cham. He is Director of Pharmacy with Legacy Health. He is the Director of Pharmacy at Legacy Emanuel Medical Center, Randall Children's Hospital, and Unity Center for Behavioral Health, uh, to be more precise. He also serves as the director of the PGY2 Infectious Diseases Residency Program. So Dominic will be doing the second half of the presentation. The first part will be presented by Lisa Gorin. She's the vice president of organizational effectiveness and talent at Legacy Health. In this role, she has the responsibility for organization development and learning, performance excellence and workforce planning and recruitment. As a member of the human resources leadership team in an organization of over 14,000 employees, Lisa believes it is essential that every single person who comes to work each day can find purpose, meaning, and joy in their work. So the first part of the session here for about 15 minutes will be presentation, and then we're going to open up into a panel discussion format. So our other two panelists are uh, Dr. Nick Cashy, Vice President of Population Health, where he oversees Legacy's effort to improve the quality of care for patients while managing costs through a clinically integrated network. This critical work is driving Legacy's transformation to become a health management company. And uh, Dr. Cashy also continues in his role as the medical director for Legacy Health Partners. And our final guest and panelist today is Dr. Jennifer Laterno. She is the clinical vice president of medical education. She is an adult critical care physician and the clinical vice president um, again, of medical education at Legacy Health. She has worked in academic, federal, community-based teaching and critical access hospitals. Um, as the Ernest G. Swigert Endowed Chair of Medical Education, she utilizes her master's degree in clinical research, her certificate in medical education, and her passion for sharing knowledge to foster academic excellence in Legacy's educational programs. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Mark, and thanks to everybody on the panel. It's always an honor uh, to present with this team uh, and represent the work uh, that we were able, uh, able to do. So uh, the objectives for this webinar, uh, we're going to talk about the need for justice and equity uh, in the uh, COVID-19 vaccination campaigns within all of healthcare. And I should say that even though we're talking about vaccination efforts today, what we're really talking about is change in human behavior. So this, everything that we're talking about is really cross applicable, um, but vaccines certainly are top of mind. We'll also review tactics for educating and engaging racially diverse healthcare employees uh, about vaccination, both policies and process and we'll be identifying key characteristics of stakeholders and content experts uh, that help build vaccine confidence. We can move on to the next slide. So we represent an organization called Legacy Health. We are in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, which means we basically live in a cloud right now and it will rain uh, through probably June and then we will uh, enter the most beautiful season that exists here. Um, and uh, this is uh, sort of the, the big dirty secret of the Pacific Northwest. Everybody thinks it rains all the time here, but actually it's glorious here. Um, at least half of the year. So uh, we're uh, an organization that uh, has revenue of um, a little bit over $2 billion. Um, we have uh, six hospitals, but we also have um, some really uh, specialized programs. We have the only burn center between Salt Lake City, San Francisco, and Seattle. We have an award-winning children's hospital. We have a level one trauma center. Um, we uh, are uh, kind of the, the lead name on uh, an emergency behavioral health uh, facility, uh, one of the only of its kind in this country. We have over 70 primary care and specialty clinics, and we invest a lot in our community. Um, here, we certainly live our mission. And so we are an organization that is 14,000 strong, but really it's thousands and thousands of physician partners, vendors, contractors serving uh, a growing metropolitan area in um, 
uh, not just Portland, but south of here throughout the Willamette Valley and north uh, of here in Southwest Washington. We can go to the next slide. So uh, like most healthcare organizations across the country, um, we were obviously in, in the thick of uh, our vaccination effort, and then uh, we kind of came to a bit of a halt. Uh, we hovered uh, around the 85% uh, uh, vaccination rate and sort of, you know, I wouldn't say that we declared victory, but I would say we had a lot uh, on our plate. So it wasn't a top priority to close the gap from 85% to 100% until uh, we uh, refamiliarized ourselves with uh, the Greek letter of Delta. So we announced uh, prior to the state mandates in Oregon and Washington, we announced an organizational vaccine mandate uh, in early August. Um, and then a few weeks later, and we, we thought this was coming, but we also weren't sure. Um, but uh, the governors of both uh, Washington and Oregon also announced um, vaccine uh, mandates. We uh, had a very ambitious timeline, which was to make sure that our employees would finish uh, their vaccine series by September 30th to avoid unpaid leave. So not termination at that point, but leave. And so people had to make sure that they were getting their first shot. And, and then uh, October 18th was um, was the deadline around employees. So we had here again, it's about a 16% gap between vaccinated and unvaccinated employees. And we had a lot of assumptions around what might improve vaccination rates at that time. And remember, that's probably nine months after people had uh, uh, access, eight months after people had access to vaccines. We can go to the next slide. So um, I, I I will say this, one thing that we could have done was say, hey, we're gonna, you know, there's obviously a requirement, there's obviously a mandate, you know, our vaccines have been out for a period of time, everybody should go get one. And I think a lot of healthcare organizations, uh, that's what they did. They, they abided by the mandate and they told their employees they should go get vaccines and they probably told them how to do that. Uh, but they probably also made a lot of assumptions that people knew how they could do that because at that time there wasn't really uh, a supply issue. Um, a, a, a few folks, and those are the folks on this panel, but it also includes folks outside of this panel. And I should say that uh, we had over 60 people involved in this work uh, adjacent to their, uh, to their full-time jobs. We had a different take on this. And that was that uh, a requirement or a mandate isn't enough to change behavior. Um, it might be enough to change a small percent of behavior. There are people who will sort of wait until they're forced to do a thing. Um, but we had a hunch that there were people who didn't know about the mandate or requirement because of lack of access to certain communication channels, both um, uh, uh, at home and uh, at work. We also uh, believed that there were people who for good reason, didn't feel safe to get a vaccine. So people who might not feel safe within the medical system itself, people who don't feel safe uh, with requirements from an employer, uh, that being us. And there are probably people who actually don't know how to access the vaccine. There are also people, and this is, was very new to me, um, there were people who didn't believe they needed to get the vaccine because they'd already had COVID. And there was a large number of those people um, actually within our within that 16% population. I can't give you a percentage, but I can tell you there was a large number there. And something I was less sensitive to, there were people who have needle phobias that frankly don't want to get, you know, I'm, non, I'm a non-clinical person. So the other three panelists here are probably unsurprised by that. I didn't appreciate that. So the goals of our work were to ensure that employees had access to the education um, uh, educational material from a trusted source and in a convenient location. Don will talk more about that, but we wanted to make sure people had the information they needed in order to make the decision that was best for them. Secondly, we wanted to make sure that that information was actually simple. Uh, I think we all agree that there's a lot of complex information that's very compelling about vaccination and about the vaccines themselves. That information is not accessible to most people. It's accessible to clinicians and technicians. And finally, we wanted to make sure 
that our unvaccinated employees actually knew that it was going to be a condition of employment. One of the key driving factors for this team was we did not want anybody missing a paycheck or losing employment and benefits, the roof over their head and the food in their mouths and, and, and potentially for their family as well, because they didn't understand the impact of the vaccine mandate or requirement. So our target audience primarily were employees who were members of populations disproportionately impacted by COVID. We know that COVID is disproportionately impacted certain communities of color, the Hispanic community and the black community primarily, but there are a lot of racially diverse uh, people who've been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. And that's uh, the population that we targeted with this effort, although we brought in uh, uh, the entire workforce uh, could participate in our efforts. Next slide. So our, the greatest challenges we faced, and I, I, I don't think these are secrets, but I think it's really important to appreciate the gravity and size of what we were up against. One was misinformation, and that is truly the second pandemic. It's the pandemic within the pandemic. The amount of misinformation that was available was astounding. Um, and we were able to access a lot of this information because we were being sent this information uh, by some of our employees. Um, but there was a lot of information that was changing, which I wouldn't consider misinformation, but the speed of good information, but also just information that wasn't uh, credible or lacked context. Secondly, this piece around social status, we had people who wanted vaccines in private, we had people who, uh, you know, didn't want their family members knowing. So um, we had uh, a, a uh, an employee who didn't want uh, their husband knowing that they were getting a vaccine. I mean, we really, uh, I think, underappreciated what social status, how the strength of social status and social status, including like religious affiliation, social affiliation, cultural affiliation, et cetera. And again, medical racism. I mean, the history of medical racism is coming to life through this pandemic, and that could not be eliminated uh, by thinking about a vaccine. I mean, this is something, this is, you know, medical testing. This is something, uh, uh, we're putting something in someone's body. Uh, we absolutely could not take that more seriously. And so when we think about medical racism, and we think about how we've built a system that actually disproportionately, uh, uh, it, disproportionately cares for. In other words, we have populations who are not afforded the same access to information and care. And that comes out in many health outcomes, including, you know, infant mortality, uh, for instance, we, we, you can't eliminate this from the equation. And we saw it come to light uh, uh, over time. I'm going to hand it over to Dom to talk about the team and also talk about our tactics. Thanks, Lisa. So in the face of the challenges that we saw and in the face of the shortened timeline, uh, the first meeting that we as a group had, uh, which included Lisa and myself and Jen and, uh, and Nick, Lisa said something that was quite striking is that we don't have enough time, we don't have enough people, we don't have enough resources, but we're going to do the best that we can. Um, the approach of not letting the fear or the drive toward perfection um, in the face of something that would that would impact the livelihoods of the people around us. We needed to set aside that type A healthcare approach to uh, the problem solutioning and solving. So the impact, so I'm given the opportunity to talk about numbers, which is always the thing that you shouldn't be talking about during a webinar, but I was a bad student in the past, so I will be talking about numbers. So over the course of the past two, of, of the two months um, leading up to the deadline, we increased our overall vaccination rates from 85% to 96% within over 1,500 employees getting at least one dose. And we say one dose because as long as an employee got a single dose of a multi-dose mRNA-based vaccine, we would consider them and continue their employment and, con and continue to maintain them within our workforce. Vaccination rates were 90% or higher across all individuals who identified their races and ethnicities. Our approach to this, we had kind of, we came to the impasse of looking at the challenges of misinformation, social status, and medical racism. The traditional modalities of communicating and educating within healthcare, uh, within the healthcare industry are twofold. One, an email. Two, a sheet of paper in a bathroom in front of you as you sit on the toilet. Those have been the most effective, deemed the most effective approaches and most common approaches to sharing information. And we said, that's not enough when someone's job is at stake. So we did two things, or well, multiple, multiple approaches and tactics to it, but we'll, I'll highlight four. One is 
saying is to combat the misinformation uh, at a virtual and, and pandemic driven virtual webcast level is that we met, we did 20 town halls reaching across different hospital sites, reaching into interdepartmental individuals, identifying really what were the types of questions and personalities and personas that made up the workforce of them. So hey, I'll, I'll talk, to the, talk to that in a bit, but when you're talking to a large group of, of clinic physicians, that's very different than talking to the facilities and maintenance group. Their needs or wants, their North Star of decision-making is very different. And so we had to change our message and it wasn't a one-size-fits-all with the town halls. We also take, took the modality and tactic of going to people, so a push method of information, knowing that there are very few departments within most organizations that have the vast majority of their employees privileged enough to stop what they're doing, pick up their phone without getting panel, without being disciplined for it, and to listen in on a virtual town hall. So instead, we went to the people. We went to the Gamba. We also set up a, in, an outreach hotline, which continues to blow my mind by the groups that stood this up, um, where we connected individuals confidentially. Uh, to either an in, in administrator who could walk through the human resources and workforce and employment logistics or connect them very rapidly to a one-on-one -on -one confidential conversation with a clinician, major of which the majority of the clinicians were physicians. What other organization out there gave that ability? Um, something that I'm incredibly proud of. And again, stood up because of the 60 plus people that Lisa had, had, had highlighted. Lastly, we maintained a weekly communication of safety education, taking the messages that came out of the town halls, the huddles, the hotlines, and bring, pushing it out to the people in the forms of FAQs, as well as a single myth buster in which we took, on, took head on a lot of the misinformation that was arising um, and being brought up during our, our forums and or those that we're seeing popularized through social media. Uh, next slide, please. So going through the numbers of what this actually looked like. So cutting it across from an ethnicity standpoint, we had our greatest increases in those who identified as American Indian, Black, and Latino, Latin, Latin X, um, with an increase of, at, of up to 18.5%, constantly greater than 10%. Many of these individuals would not have had the opportunity to have an informed decision just by nature of the medical racism that, that, that occurs and that's innately built into organizational communication. Um, next slide, please. Another way to look at this um, is looking at it from, from the at a departmental level. Many of your organizations are uh, look, likely look very, very similar to legacy health. So when we looked at it from there, we knew that many of the previous numbers of the, from an ethnicity standpoint are actually pretty hyper-concentrated into each of the departments themselves and that the distribution wasn't normalized at all. And so as I'm highlighting some of the departments that we spent very intentional curated messaging to, it does highlight what type of impact that does. I have no doubt in my mind that if we just cookie cutter and one size fit all our message and our tactic and our approach and our collaboration and the stakeholders that we engaged, the numbers would not look like this. Um, the numbers would clearly not look like this. The differences wouldn't look like this. And I think that a lot of it came down to just listening, 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 and taking people along with us to make sure that the messenger that was giving the information was a trusted individual rather than in an electronic form or an anonymous um, voice in a box or someone of an administrative uh, stance. So that's a quick take on what we did at Legacy Health. Um, I think the fun of this is going to be the panel that we're that we're about to uh, uh, start. So next slide with a thank you uh, for your attention for Death by PowerPoint. So here comes the fun. Yeah. So thank you for um, framing the challenge and the results. And so now during you know the panel Q and A session, we'll be able to take a deeper dive into. Um, how you went about this and what some of those other considerations were. So just a couple quick announcements before we go into that panel mode. And, and again, please feel free to enter your own questions using the Q&A button in uh, the Zoom webinar panel. Um, we invite you to come visit our website at valuecapturellc.com. We have 
uh, free books and uh, a blog and podcasts and white papers and case studies um, where you can learn more about the type of healthcare improvement work that we um, support people in, in doing. Um, we currently have a book giveaway contest that is open and running through uh, December 10th. It's to commemorate what would have been uh, Paul O'Neill's 86th birthday this past um, Saturday. So uh, there's a contest you can enter where we're giving away sets of books, um, one book called A Playbook for Habitual Excellence, which is a collection of transcripts of some speeches that uh, Paul O'Neill gave to healthcare audiences. The second item is a book, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Um, Paul O'Neill and um, his story at Alcoa and beyond are covered in a chapter of that book. And then there's uh, a hat from our friends and partners at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, uh, the zero hat, the goal of zero harm, of course, being an important goal um, of Paul O'Neill's and something that's important to us at Value Capture. So you can enter using the link on screen, or you can just go to valuecapturellc.com slash birthday, and that'll also send you there. Um, so just to reintroduce our panelists again, uh, Dom Chan, the Director of Pharmacy, Lisa Gorin, Vice President of Organizational Effectiveness and Talent, Dr. Nick Cashy, Vice President of Population Health, and Dr. Jennifer Letourneau, Clinical Vice President of Medical Education. So uh, first question to take a, a little bit more of a, a deeper dive into this. Um, what made you decide to approach this challenge from an equity lens, uh, Dr. Cashy? Yeah, thanks, and thanks everyone for being here and for your time. Um, I, you know, I think Elisa teed it off in, in the beginning of the presentation, but I, you know, I would summarize it as our biggest fear with all of this is that we would get to our, you know, we had a mandate, we had a deadline to meet. And um, our biggest concern as an organization was that we would approach that deadline and have suddenly laid off a number of employees of color uh, who we didn't do our due diligence to make sure they had all the information and availability of you know, information to make their decision for themselves and make an informed, educated decision about their vaccination status. Um, and if we got to that deadline and wound up laying off people because they just didn't know, didn't have the information they needed, we didn't do enough of our legwork to answer their questions, that would be you know, the perpetuation of systemic racism that we've been committed as an organization to you know, becoming an anti-racist organization and, and stopping the perpetuation of these institutional uh, forms of racism. So that was really kind of our North Star guiding principle behind, behind this whole effort. Um, how, how did you ensure the consistency of message to, to your staff? Uh, so, you know, as uh, Don mentioned, we had, a, you know, there were over 60 people involved in this overall communication effort. Um, so I think that was a really important piece. We used a bunch of our research. So we established, uh, we had a chant, we were, we're a Microsoft Teams organization. We had a channel that we collated all our resources and so we made a concerted effort to con consistently work off of a master list of, or a centralized list of, uh, of uh, references and resources. So we would internally collate that list to make sure that we're using primarily, you know, peer reviewed and CDC uh, guidance. Um, and then we're all working off the same playbook. Uh, we also huddled weekly to make, in the beginning actually even daily, to make sure to compare notes, talk about conversations that we were having with employees. A lot of us who were working that uh, hot, the daily, you know, the hotline, would we would compare notes and say, I, you know, these are concerns I'm hearing, and this is how we are address them. Um, so we shared kind of our, our our approaches there to make sure we had. A, a uniform approach and, and, and shared best practices among, I mean, we were learning at the same time, right, in terms of how to do this. So having those kind of regular touch points, having a shared center, set of resources, um, those all kind of helped us um, kind of make sure that we were consistently giving people the same information and, and being consistent across the board. Right, well, thanks. So you, you're touching on trying to put out you know, accurate, helpful information. Um, Dr. Letourneau, how did you approach the misinformation that was being brought to your attention? Yeah, this was so hard, right? As a clinician, uh, 
watching the media, the headlines, hearing people talk about uh, not only misinformation, but really what seemed like intentional disinformation. So uh, like Nick uh, alluded to, we had regular meetings about what was out there. And so we all brought kind of our ideas about what were the things that we had seen, you know, the different tweets from celebrities, uh, how we might address those issues. And then through the town halls, you know, this iterative process, we learned more things. So there were some times when we were doing town halls where people would ask questions that none of us really knew what the answer was, right? So we had to be very vulnerable as clinicians and say, I don't know, let me get back to you. And we always had a follow-up process. So one thing we were very conscientious of doing is ensuring that we didn't um, dismiss the misinformation, right? I think that it um, is easy for people with authority um, and knowledge to say, oh no, that's that's doesn't that's ridiculous, right? What we had to do is say, yeah, we understand that all this information out there, it's hard to sort out what's what's real, what are facts, and what really isn't accurate. So we did go back to the sources of this misinformation. Um, a lot of it was um, lay science writers' interpretation of preprint articles, articles that hadn't been peer-reviewed, double-checked um, by other scientists, which is kind of the gold standard for uh, the scientific process. And we actually read those and said, well, so I know that this person interpreted it that way. However, here's another interpretation. And we would, in the during the town halls, we had another set of clinicians, aside from the featured clinicians who are answering questions, who would add links to credible sources of information. Uh, which were, you know, kind of either peer reviewed or written in lay terms that could be understandable. And we always came with compassionate correction, right? The idea that I know that you are a smart person, you're discerning, you care about yourself and your family and your ability to care for your family. So you need to make the best decision for you. And we're here to help you wade through all of that information to get to the best sources that we believe in and that we trust in and that we can help you get there. So, um, and again, I think that uh, previously in the podcast, um, Don and Lisa talked about how we weren't trying to convince you to get vaccinated. We were trying to help you have the best information possible to make the best choice for you. And I think that keeping on that message was extraordinarily helpful. And you know, I don't think you know we, we have time here to go through every um, example of misinformation, but one that Lisa brought up that um, might help us ad um, address if somebody does come to you with this, this idea of, well, I, I had COVID before, Therefore, I don't need to get vaccinated. What what science or evidence or sources would you point to, to to help educate somebody about that? Yeah, that was a really commonly asked question for sure. And so uh, there was a study that was put out by the CDC uh, in Kentucky where they looked at individuals who had had COVID previously and individuals who had been vaccinated. And those who had had COVID previously were more likely to get COVID a second time than those who are vaccinated. And so really that was kind of the um, best information at the time. We know now that we, if we follow antibody type, like amount of antibody you create after infection versus after vaccine, uh, there's a ton of variability after infection. Uh, so you could have actually pretty low antibody levels after a mild infection, which would not necessarily be protective of subsequent infection. Whereas after vaccine, there's been consistently higher amounts. And again, now we see uh, kind of moving out farther, getting gathering more information, right? All of this is gathering more information, feeding into our knowledge so that we know more, that uh, individuals who've been more distant from their last infection or the last vaccine are more likely to get COVID a second time. So uh, those are the types of, that's the type of information that we were able to share. Uh, and there was a lot of, um, you know, the natural immunity idea, right? So the immunity you get from being infected is better than vaccine. And that was based on a preprint article that still hasn't been uh, published in a peer reviewed journal. Uh, and so we had to talk about some of the gaps in that article and why, 
you know, yes, natural immunity is good, right? Uh, getting a vaccine. Actually, we know that after getting a vaccine, uh, your natural immunity is boosted even more. So that was the type of information that we were able to provide to people. Okay, thank you for that. Um, going to you, Lisa, this is a question we, we plan to discuss. Um, Oren from the audience also asked basically the same thing. Um, did you approach different groups in different ways? You know, how so, what informed those different approaches? Yeah, so great question. Uh, the answer is yes and no. So uh, I'm not a clinician, I'm a social scientist. My background is in organizational development. And so human behavior and, and team functioning is kind of my uh, area of expertise. And I, I mentioned that to say that I always think humans are um, highly predictive, uh, predictive or predictable, and they surprise me all the time. So you kind of have to look at the, you know, the common pieces of why somebody might might change or information they might be receptive to, who's giving me the information? So we certainly were conscious of, is this somebody who I can relate to uh, because we're the same race, because I feel a kinship to them somehow, because they're speaking in a way that, you know, connects with me somehow. So, you know, communication and building rapport, you know, that is absolutely something that transcends uh, uh, any engagement effort. And it was something that we were relatively attentive to in certain, uh, when we could be. So when we could go and visit uh, a team huddle, when our Black Employee Resource Group uh, sponsored an event. So those were examples of where we could be attentive to it uh, occasionally on uh, a virtual town hall. We couldn't be attentive to that uh, necessarily on the hotline uh, because we had to staff that uh, with whoever was available. Um, so we did our best to kind of customize the um, uh, deliverer of information, the communicator, uh, as much as possible. And same with the tactics. We made sure that our tactics were, uh, that we didn't just have one layer of tactics, but really when we were thinking about change management engagement, again, transcendent is you need to hear information multiple times. I think it's like six times. Don't check me on that in order for it to actually sink in. So we needed to hear the same information multiple times, but we also needed to give people access to multiple opportunities. We can't just show up at a huddle and expect somebody to roll their sleeves up. Now that did happen, but I can guarantee you it probably wasn't the first time most of those people had considered getting a vaccine. It might've been like the fourth time they considered getting a vaccine. So, um, so, so my answer is yes and no. So Lisa, you mentioned employee resource groups, you know, ERGs. Can you talk a little bit more about the role of, of those groups in this effort? Yeah, I mean, I would say that that uh, the employee resource group that was most um, engaged uh, and, uh, and also had a high, you know, at the beginning of our work had a higher number of unvaccinated uh, employees was the Black Employee Resource Group. Um, they did a tremendous job of being a communication channel, putting on multiple town halls, both uh, safely in person as well as virtually. Um, and we made sure that, uh, you know, we were supporting what they thought would work versus uh, the other way around. So again, you know, this entire engagement strategy was really about a series of experiments where we would run those experiments and then we would adjust uh, those approaches. And so our employee resource groups are essential to that because they're often representing the groups who are underrepresented or being disproportionately impacted by the disease. And they also know the more uh, um, uh, yeah, credible, I guess, uh, uh, communication tactics uh, beyond our traditional channels. Yeah, well, thanks, Lisa. And uh, another question um, that, that that came from Andrew, and and I think you know you've been prepared to answer this. Um, what, what did you find any hostility from any employees toward the pro vaccine message? Were there any strategies to help enable an open dialogue to help somebody consider change? So there are a couple of things. One is, I mean, absolutely. We absolutely faced hostility uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll share where and then I'll share um, what we did about that. So early on when we did virtual town halls, uh, we were so adorable. So we would have this virtual town hall with 250 uh, staff at the hospital that consistently had the large, the highest number, and still does, of COVID patients and the highest number of unvaccinated, I think, proportionally, um, highest number of uh, 
uh, unvaccinated staff. And so we just sort of turned it on and said, hey, fill the chat with your questions and your comments. And it was mayhem. And we did that a few times. And I mean, by mayhem, I mean, I think we did an exceptional job, but I think we were putting our expert panelists in a really rough spot because we were making them defensive when they didn't need to be. So that's when we started tightening the screws a little bit on format. So we would tell people, here are the rules of engagement. You cannot post other sources. That was a place where we were receiving, I would call it more passive aggressive hostility. So Jen or Nick or Don might answer a question and then someone would go, well, actually, and then they would put you know, that, that, that uh, interpretation of the study that Jen referenced in the chat. So all of a sudden codified, we have this history that someone could watch, but then they were getting distracted by misinformation. So we would tell people basically, you, we'll kick you out of the meeting. I mean, we said it uh, much kinder. Uh, if you're going to populate the chat with any hostility uh, or loaded questions. So there were times when I had to ask people to reframe their questions or comments or misinformation. Um, we definitely had hostility on the other end of the phone on uh, some of our, um, uh, for some of our hotline folks, and they're not trained service, you know, uh, call center people. So we didn't expect them to deescalate. We just, hey, this is the one time, oh, you're still screaming at me, click. And for the most part, we were really trying to focus on and manage to the population who was going to change their behavior, genuinely needed more information, genuinely did not need us to judge them for not being vaccinated, who just needed to be supported with the right information, to make the right decision. If you keep your mind on that, everything else sort of falls to the wayside, but it was definitely a known distraction that we had to manage. So thank you, Lisa. Um, Dom, uh, a question for you. What would you recommend to other organizations who are um, just starting on this journey? Yeah, um, at the risk of um, throwing in a competitor market share element, uh, I listened to to David McRaney's You Are Not So Smart podcast, and he has an episode that's about three hours long, but it's addressing vaccine hesitancy. And he interviewed nine individuals that talked about persuasiveness, and et cetera. The key message that I remember taking back to our group from that was this, is that our goal isn't to convince anyone. The instant that we do that and the instant an organization's intent is to convince someone to do something that they don't want to do, we've lost the argument. We've lost, what's the point? That's our ego coming. Instead, our goal should be being able to understand the other person a little bit more and for them to understand us a little bit more so that we are amicable to getting back together and continuing the conversation on a later date. Um, the, the whole, the whole um, polarizing of vaccines has been probably one of the most terrible things to watch as someone's coming from infectious diseases. Um, it's been heartbreaking. So that's my one, one, one piece of advice of don't, make it your goal to convince, but instead to learn more about the other individual or individuals on that side of the phone camera fence. Um, to others, just quickly, is progress over perfection. Um, don't let, don't be paralyzed by the idea of perfection. Instead, just go into knowing that you're going to, we tripped over ourselves over and over and over again. And which transitions to the next piece of advice is don't do it alone. Because as we tripped over each other, we, pick, we picked each other up, we brushed ourselves off, we vented at each other, we were vulnerable to each other, we slapped each other in the side of the head because we were, we were approaching things in our own biased path. Um, so don't convince people, progress of perfection and don't do it alone. Thanks, Dom. So speaking of don't do it alone, um, question for you, Lisa, how, how did you start Kind of from baseline of zero activity to having such a dedicated team. I mean, this is this is the least scientific. My Rolodex is big and powerful because it isn't about. It, it, there isn't really an answer here, except I identified a small group of people. I don't know. It was less than ten, I think, uh, folks, and. We got together and we talked and then it was sort of like, bring a friend. I mean, maybe it's like Amway, bring a friend, bring another friend. The thing is, is doing the right thing is contagious. 
people heard about it and they wanted to be a part of it. People, I mean, you know, Dom alluded to this, the hotline that we created and the way that we were able to staff a hotline. I mean, truly show me a, it, another phone number in this country where you could pick up a phone and quickly talk to a physician, pharmacist, or a clinician and ask every single question you have about a vaccine and not be judged for it. I don't, I don't know that that existed. I'm not saying it didn't, but I, I doubt there were many. I don't think they were prolific. That was created because, not because of Dom and Jen and, and Nick and I. It was created because two other people said this is something we were able to do when we had a pretty horrible wildfire about uh, a, a little bit over a year ago. And they said we could actually just shift that model and apply it here. And I think that's the learning of this work is today it's about vaccines. Yesterday it's about wildfires. I don't even want to think about what it is, you know, what it's about tomorrow. But who you know is powerful. And you don't have to know 10 amazing people. You have to know one amazing person who's really up for doing the right thing and up for uh, uh, the right work and can stay on message. I can't tell you how many times I would bring an idea to Dom and he would say politely to me, that's cool. So is that really in the lane of our purpose here? Uh, because let's keep the eye on, you know, what we're really talking about is equity and information. So it's nice that those people over there don't have all the information, but with our scarce resources, where should we be spending our time? And it's that kind of commitment to mission that also um, becomes a magnet for the people who are willing to do uh, this kind of work. And I would open this question actually to the whole team. Does anybody else want to chime in on uh, how we were able to sort of snowball create such an engaged group of professionals? Yeah, I, I, I can speak a little bit to that. You know, uh, pretty much if Lisa Gorin calls, I'll say, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, Dom had reached out to me and, you know, once I understood kind of what the uh, intent and purpose was, I thought about, well, who do I know who could do this? Uh, and this all happened while we were in our peak and, you know, I'm an ICU doctor. So I was feeling a little crispy on the edges, uh, but I found that this work actually helped mitigate some of my burnout because uh, I felt like I could help people get to this place where um, they were getting the best possible information. Um, and it helped me understand better all the phone calls I've got from family about why aren't you giving my loved one ivermectin? Um, so it actually did, it was therapy for me as well. So I looked around my group and thought, well, who else can do this kind of compassionate communication and kind of put aside some of the frustration that we're all feeling. And there were a lot of really great people who could do it. And they also felt kind of the same sense of purpose and helping our, you know, uh, a lot of my colleagues will talk about our legacy family, right? We're a decent sized organization, yet we've always been very close knit and tied to the community. And so that sort of kind of effort to help, uh, the community and our employees inside the community uh, really uh, rang true in this. So it's kind of like the uh, coming together during a crisis again, which we have done that so many times. And yet there are still people with enough energy who help inspire me to keep going. So we really were able to uh, find those people and it kind of, you know, boosted all of us up. Anything else to add on, on on that topic of sort of you know building the team, building the coalition? Don't be afraid to ask. I think that's that's it. I mean, if they say no, that's the same result if you never asked in the first place. Mm -hmm. Peer pressure works. Yeah. So um, another question for you, Dr. Letourneau. When you talk about you know the, the, all of this information, you know, media, journals preprint articles, um, fast moving environment. How, how do you take all of that information and sort of decide what to share and how to share it in a way that that's digestible and understandable? Yeah, I think that it, we definitely PDCA that, right? So uh, it, we did kind of come together as a team, talked about kind of the most common questions, right? So we had the FAQ page, uh, we put that together. We actually did have written information that we shared. We had an 
amazing uh, project manager who also was an expert in health literacy, who helped us make it health literacy friendly. Um, and then we were able to learn from that part and then translate that into our hotline phone calls and our town halls. And so each time it got better and better. And we were able to take feedback from you know, the one-on-one -on -one calls, the huddles, and again, make this FAQ page stronger. Uh, I think it's really easy for clinicians to kind of fall into clinician talk uh, because it's more efficient, uh, but slowing it down and understanding what is it people are really asking. I think that that is another thing that I learned from this experience is that what I assumed were the questions were not the questions, uh, that they actually had a different set of questions. And when I did the hotline, a lot of my discussions were with people who were just plain scared. Uh, and fear was a huge driver of this and kind of the, you know, humans are terrible at estimating risk, right? And so that overestimate of the risks of vaccine versus the risks of COVID was a huge driver for a number of individuals. And so really talking about not just the science, but really kind of the fear and where that comes from and how... I, as a human, also experience fear and the things that I have experienced. And, um, you know, again, saying, so what are the parts, right? And then kind of talking about it, like if I was talking to, you know, my non-physician uh, family, right? Uh, I think those are the ways that we were able to translate that into meeting people where they are and talking about it on kind of plain language terms. And again, you know, so thankful for Anna Pearson, our project manager, who was able to say, uh, no, that's, that's, let me rewrite that. And I'm like, oh, that is better. <laughs> yeah. There's, a, I think, a really good general point to extend beyond um, being careful about clinician talk. Those of us who are non-clinicians sometimes run the risk of falling into lean talk. And so that that reminder to, to state things in plain language, not to, to let jargon or assumptions get in the way. That's I think that's a really important point in general. Um, Lisa, I got a question for you uh, from from Oren, or it's it's based on something you had said earlier um, that you pointed out uh, a mandate isn't enough to change behavior. Um, so Oren was wondering um, what role, if any, did positive reinforcement play in the process as opposed to the threat of losing a job? For, for Lisa or for anyone else who wants to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I can I, I can start, but I think the team uh, experienced this particularly prob probably on the hotline. So sure, I mean, one is again, when you have somebody talking to you about something really difficult to understand or a hard decision, you probably wanna have some level of rapport with them. So, um, you know, whether that's, hey, I live nearby, I've worked here for a really long time. I mean, even just the way that we would introduce ourselves, we th I think was an equalizer, maybe not so much on the town halls, but when we would go to huddles, I would, you know, the, who, nobody cared about my title, but I would say I've worked at Legacy for 18 years. This is the hospital, you know, that's a mile from my house. I mean, there are ways that we, and so to me, that's a strategy around reinforcing positive behavior. I think we were really overt about our goal. So I think right when we walked in and we said, listen, our goal isn't necessary. We would love if you got a vaccine, let's be honest. <laughs> so we, are, we are committed to that. And we're not like, let's be really upfront about it. The goal of this is to give you access to information. I think that definitely lowered people's um, defense mechanisms. And so again, I think that built kind of positive reinforcement. You know, it's really hard to, to, to have something that's more positive than you're not going to lose your job. But we would talk about the requirement in a way that talked about people's livelihoods more than their job. So there's a way that you could talk about that where it's like, you're going to lose your job. We were overt about it because clarity is kindness. But we would also say we want to make sure that every single person has the opportunity to get a paycheck as long as you want to. You're part of our legacy family. And because of that, we want to make sure that you're cared for. And I will tell you that um, we know for a fact, at least I mean, it can, can facts be anecdotal? Our competitors didn't engage in the same type of engagement effort. And so for us, there's also a long game here, which is what does it say about our culture when we just rely on a mandate or a requirement versus what is it that we say when we say, hey, we want to make sure everybody that's on the bus right now is still on the bus <laughs> because you're here for a reason and you're really valuable to our team. So I think it really came across in the way we communicated with people. But again, I would, I would open it up uh, to my colleagues here. 
Nick? He may have frozen. Uh, he may have frozen up. He he had warned us his internet was not cooperating today. So if we get him back, we can uh, we can come back to him. Um, we, we were going to also explore a little bit. You emphasize so much um, cycles of improvement, PDCA cycles, or PDSA, or continuous improvement cycles, or whatever you would call it. Um, if we get Doctor Kashi back, we we're going to talk to him about. Some of the things that you changed as you were coming along, um, Dom, we were going to ask you about some things that stayed the same, maybe as you were considering um, what was working, what could work better. Uh, Dr. Kashi, if you're back, um, what, what were some of the things that you did change as you went through these cycles of learning and iteration and improvement? Um, yeah, I am sorry, I've got a bit of an unstable connection here, but um... So I think we've touched on a few of them uh, in terms of uh, managing the chat and, you know, terms, uh, the initial, I think a lot of it, it was kind of like how we managed those overall town halls uh, from both a just upfront messaging to say, you know, please don't, you know, the chat is, you know, please don't post unless you're part of the panel uh, rather than where we started as a free for all. Um, uh, by the last few, we actually wind up using Teams Live, where it's not just an open chat, and you know there's an opportunity for the panel uh, for a moderator to kind of curate the chat a little bit more. Uh, and that was definitely much, much that was significantly uh, significantly changed the tenor of the of the chat. Um, I think other adjustments were, I mean constant refining of our, our resources. And, you know, as we came up against different hesitations and reasons for hesitation, making sure we have resources to acknowledge those, you know, um, there are so many individual different reasons for why people were, had concerns about the vaccine. Um, and also different things, different people needed to hear. And I mean, I had some, you know, I had a, you know, I think we often talk about the power of store of the individual story, and I started that conversation in, in one con with one individual who very quickly shut me down. Was like, I don't need to hear any anecdotes. I'm a scientist. I need, you know, I need the big numbers. Don't you? Think? And really, was almost indignant. Like, how dare you throw an anecdote at me? Right? Um, I was like, whoa, okay, okay, fine, you're good enough. And so, you, I think we had to learn to be super you know, really customized to the individual. Um, so we had to have a wide kind of selection. And there are other people who are very different, right? Who the individual story made all the difference and the numbers kind of went in one ear and went out, out the other. Um, so um, so I think building that library was, and those varied approaches throughout the course of this. Um, the other little adjustments, uh, I think, you know, there were some operational pieces of taking care of our team as well. Our hotline, we started some pretty, I think we were very ambitious in the beginning and started like, I think, seven to nine, like 7 a.m. to nine. I mean, we really covered most of the day, which was really important. I mean, we wanted to cover, I mean, healthcare is a 24-7 operation. Uh, we could not staff a 24-7 hotline. That would have been a little over the top, but um but we started looking at our call volumes and when they really started to taper off because, you know, I think despite everyone's uh, engagement, it, it still was, it, it still was hard to be on, you know, essentially be on call through nine o'clock at night on after a long administrative day. So we, we adjusted those, we split them up into a little bit more manageable blocks for the individuals also just to give more flexibility with other meetings and other, mm -hmm. other and clinical responsibilities. Um, those were, oh, oh, and then the other piece was, uh, and you, you see it in action today, we initially started our town halls with kind of just an open panel, and we'd have two to, so anywhere between two and four panelists. Um, we learned after a first few that assigning kind of initial questions, our, our pre-populated questions, helps really convey a sense of confidence that we got the feedback that even though we all kind of, I think we all knew, we all knew the, there was always that polite kind of awkward pause of like, who's going to take this question? Um, and that actually often got interpreted as, oh, those guys don't know what they're talking about. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, that was actually a really, that was a big learning. I think that was a big critical learning point. Um, I don't know if anyone else has other thoughts from the team. 
those were my highlights. <laughs> yeah. Or Dom, maybe to turn it to you, were, were there things that you kept the same through those cycles of, of learning and um, you know, looking to improve things that you continue doing? And was there anything that you just stopped doing as opposed to find a better way to do something? Yeah, I think the most important thing from that remained the same was our mission. Uh, we were very unapologetically biased toward making sure our tactics had the most impact and power for our employees who identified as black indigenous, indigenous or people of color. Um, just outright, we just kind of said that as a label. We also made made a statement that, again, majority of our resources were focused on individuals who didn't have the ability to access their email 24 hours a day, individuals that could just jump on uh, a virtual conference. So, so that was maintained for the entire continuum of the two months um, to say we, we, we will do these virtual town halls because there is value but we will very quickly pivot our time and resources toward a hotline because it's a phone. It's a phone and it's something that perhaps many individuals would say, well, why would anybody need, need to call? That's that innate, innate bias that exists within an organization of why we said then this is the reason why. And even if you don't understand it, we're going to maintain it. Um, so that's something that remained true throughout the course of the two months. Something that we stopped um, I'm a fan of not reinventing the wheel and just taking great ideas and incorporating them in because I don't have time. And we did that. We saw a uh, an organization, um, you know, a local 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 organization that had an earlier deadline than us. Um, and what they saw on the last day was this immense rush of employees toward tables that overwhelmed vac vaccinators and kept them beyond, well beyond the closing hours. So we said, well, we don't wanna get in that position. Let's go ahead and stand up and staff and resource these pop-up tables to make sure that if someone wants it, location, locale would not be a barrier to that in addition to bringing things to huddles and meetings and such. So we did that, we resourced heavily. We pulled on resource pools in an already tough staffing and workforce environment. And we had maybe single digits if we were lucky at these tables. Um, our presumption and assumptions was shocking and surprising for us when, when we saw that. And we, as we maintained them and said, maybe it's just, it's gonna take some time from message to action. Um, so we waited a few days, maybe up to a week, I can't remember, uh, maybe a week or so, maybe a little longer than that and we said, this is just not working. This is this this is something that it worked for another organization um, and with many other inputs and variables, but for us, that's not what we need to do and, and resource. So we pulled that back and pulled the resource back pretty pretty quickly and rapidly. All right, well, thanks, Dom. And, and maybe a, a final question here that came in from the audience, really good question here. Do you see opportunities for taking the new awareness about how different groups process and access information? and applying that learning to other scenarios or processes? Will you wait for something to come up or do you propose being proactive to look at some of the key processes through this awareness? We always wanna be proactive, right? I mean, that's the goal, but I think that it's within, within the mental real estate, we are gonna be reactionary in some senses. And this, I, uh, one thing to highlight from our internal communications group and external and internal communications group were fantastic partners in all of this is that they said that there's so many lessons that came out of this from a communication and engaging employees that they have to take a, take a very long moment to really introspect about what their modality moving forward is going to be. You know, emails and electronic communication may not be the way to go despite that being the pervasive, pervasive modality across many industries. Yeah, I don't think there, you know, the the big learning of this webinar is there isn't anything new here. So, right, this is really the buffet that builds a change management engagement plan. It happened to be around a life-saving vaccine. And so we have a lot to say about it. It also happened to focus on the population that needed it the most. Um, this, we always used to say this, this is one at a time work. I mean, how many texts do I have between me and Dom and Anna where we would hear about somebody getting vaccinated and it was a success story because it was somebody, uh, we have one individual who was very vocal and wasn't shy about who they were in multiple chats around being anti-vaccination and ultimately we know received the vaccine. 
We know that there was an individual who brought her, herself and her family uh, at about eight or nine at night to one of our hospitals. And a series of leaders who were not at that hospital made sure that she and her family could get vaccinated. This work is, we are so proud. We, uh, I think, ultimately became the uh, health system with the highest vaccination rate. Um, uh, I believe that's true in the state and probably one of the highest in the country. But ultimately, change management and communication is really, it takes time and it's one at a time work. So for us, as the risk gets higher, when it comes to you know loss of employment or it comes to public health, that will be a trigger for us around uh, doing something a bit differently. All right, well, um, thank you to all of our panelists. We've got a couple of thank yous coming in through um, the chat. So I um, want to thank our panelists uh, from Legacy Health, uh, Lisa Gorin, Dom Chan, Dr. Jen Letourneau, Dr. Nick Kashi. Um, thank you for, for sharing what you did. You know, I think the key, the key lessons, the mindsets, and the approaches that you've taken, um, I think really helpful, really valuable. So on behalf of the team at Value Capture, thanks to all of you for taking the time to share this with us today and um, helping others take these lessons forward in their own cycles of experimentation and improvement and learning. Thank you. Thank you for helping um, seed that with others here today. Really appreciate it.